Kara, hi. Hi, Megan. We're recording our first episode since Kara had her sweet little baby. Oh, my gosh. And we're both like, it's, how do we do this? <laughs> yeah, what buttons do we push? It's funny. It hasn't been that long, but it's confusing. It really hasn't. How do we say words? Yeah, no. no, we're always like that. Yeah, <laughs> that's a fair point. <laughs> I feel like after I had a baby, my voice got deeper. It's really weird. It's very hot. I, like, I think don't things don't things like that change? I think I think everything changes. Change, everything about my body changes <laughs> when I have children. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and nothing has nothing, ever been. I was going to say nothing's going back. Nothing is ever <laughs> no. going to go back to be the same. Oh, I haven't told you this. Yet. Oh my gosh. Um. I I broke my foot. <gasps> I broke a bone in my foot. What? I know. How? I You don't. Well, I was uh I was walking uh-huh. and I was just coming around the corner and there there was this building on fire and <laughs> oh. it had kittens and yeah, puppies yeah, and, yeah. and orphaned children hungry. You jumped out of the um, and I floor. saved every one of them. Right. And, yeah. 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 So you heard about it. Mm -hmm. I see. Yeah. I saw it on the news. No, I don't know. I just can't walk. I can't. I I was going down the stairs too quickly and I missed the last step and there was a turn. I can't even explain how it happened. The dogs were going crazy and here we are. At least there were dogs involved in this story as well. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yes. Jesus. And they are precious. Are you like in a boot or are you? Yes, I am. Oh, God. And it is. It looks real good. Which Um, foot is it? It goes with everything. Uh-huh. My right foot. Oh, your so driving, driving foot is fun. Mm-hmm. So you're yeah. like pedal yeah. to the metal. <laughs> <laughs> I just hobble all over the place. It's wow. real great. But I've never broken anything. Oh my god! New experiences. <laughs> 2023 coming in hot. Oh hey, this is the Witch's Magic Murder <laughs> and Mystery Podcast. I'm Karen. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Megan. <laughs> First time recording in a while, so catching up. I think this is going well. I think it's great. Everything's great. <laughs> so we're hopping in here because we wanted to get one specific episode out to you guys yes. sooner. Yes, we still have a pre-recorded episode to go, but we wanted to get this one out because it's a little time sensitive. I think. Sort and of. this episode comes with perks. Yes, I'm so excited about the perks. Yes, yes. All right, so <laughs> this is one of those stories. That I have always known, yes. and I imagine Kara has too, because it's like Kentucky lore. It's right yeah. up there with the Kentucky meat shower. It's just one of those stories that if you're from around here, you know, you've at least heard of it, even if you don't know every detail. But now there is a movie coming out in February. Ooh. I know. Every, now everybody is finding out about this story. And we've had a few people ask in the Facebook group, they're like, are you serious? Is this a thing? <laughs> right. Yes. So, Today, I'm going to tell you all the true story of the cocaine bear. Oh, gosh. I can't wait. It is also known as the Bluegrass Conspiracy, thanks to a book by that name written by Sally Denton. Mm -hmm. I own it. I've read it a long time ago. It's a very thick book, so it's kind of intimidating when you look at it. But it's, especially if you're from around here, there's so many places and stuff that you'll recognize. It makes it really interesting. Yes. And it's just a wild story anyway. It really is. It's crazy. But it, like you said, it is such a thick book that it took me a bit to get through. Like I had to take breaks and usually I don't like to do that with books. Yeah. Well, you know how some books are like they're thick books and they put maybe, in my opinion, too many words per page. Yes, exactly. Like the font yep. is too small. Yep. And I'm just like, ugh. but man, it's a good, it's a wild story. Mm-hmm. If you've never heard of it, you're going to be surprised. Yes. So, okay, let's go. Andrew Thornton, the second was born in Bourbon County, Kentucky, on October 30th, 1944. So close to having the coolest birthday ever, but really? just just not quite. Just a day shy. His friends call him Drew, and I will probably call him just whatever pops out of my mouth. Whatever feels right at the moment, yes. <laughs> His parents owned a horse farm, and he grew up in the Lexington area. He went to high school at Sayre, which is like... <laughs> A super fancy private school. It is. It's beautiful Mm -hmm. in downtown Lexington. And he was in the Iroquois Polo Club. These are just all things that tell us that Andrew came from a wealthy family. Right. A friend described Andrew as one of the smartest fellows I ever met. Fellows. 
Mm -hmm. In school, he did very well. He came from a good family and had everything in the world going for him. That's all this quote from a friend. He went to a military academy and graduated in 1962, and then he joined the ROTC. He went to the University of Kentucky for a semester, and then he dropped out and joined the Army. Right. So these are all normally details I'd skip, but it's important. Mm -hmm. Yeah. (laughs) It comes up later. Yes. He trained at Fort Bragg as a paratrooper for the 82nd Airborne Division, and he was described as a, quote, expert skydiver. Yep. Have you ever been skydiving? Nope. No, thank you. My mom went skydiving, like, I don't know, four years ago or something like that. Mm. And she didn't tell any of us she was going to do it. And my mom, she would have been like 65. Oh, yeah. I remember you telling me about this. Yes, when it happened. All of a sudden, she sends me this YouTube link, and it's from her (laughs) skydiving. And I could not (laughs) believe it. (laughs) <laughs> and my dad, because my dad and I are both really afraid of heights. And yes. so we were both like, oh, my God. I'm so glad she didn't tell us because yes. we would have had some kind you of you would have tried to talk her out of it. I have zero desire. No, thank you. No. I don't like being up high at all. No. So more power to these people. Yeah. So he was an expert skydiver. He participated in the 1965 U.S. invasion of the Dominican Republic and received a Purple Heart for his service. Hmm. Then he went back to school for a year, but he ended up dropping out in order to train racehorses with his dad. At some point, he starts taking night classes at Eastern Kentucky University, and he graduated with a degree in law enforcement, and he joined the Lexington Fayette Urban County Police Department in 1968. Mm-hmm. By the early 70s, Andrew was part of the narcotic squad at the Lexington PD, and he worked with the Louisville DEA, too. Yep. Police Chief John McFadden described Drew as an average officer. While he was doing all of this, he took night classes again, this time at the University of Kentucky, and earned his law degree in 1976. So wild. I know. Well, like, let me just do all the things. Right. And the thing, I mean, I do admire the fact that he really, he could have just lived off his family family's mm-hmm. wealth. He could have just gone into the horse business and wouldn't have had to do much at all. Yeah. Um, but he's like an achiever. He went out and made his own career that had nothing to do with horses. Taking night classes while working full time is not easy. I've done it. It's no, hard. Oh, heck no. Yeah, same. So he worked for the police department for nine years before resigning in 1977. And uh, he finished up his studies and he practiced law. <laughs> Very Work next door. Uh, P.S. My dad. My dad has some weird connections to this guy. To this guy, Andrew Thornton, because of the horses. Yeah. Yeah. I wondered with you, your because it was your grandfather that trained horses, right? Right. Yeah. Interesting. Mm-hmm. He didn't talk about it a lot, though. <laughs> <laughs> Can't imagine why. I know. In 1981, Drew is among 25 men in Fresno, California, who go to court for. No, I'm sorry. He's accused of stealing weapons from the China Lake Naval Weapons Center, which, bold, you know? Yeah, whoa. (laughs) And of conspiring to smuggle a 1,000 pounds of marijuana into the United States. Andrew pleads not guilty, and then he left California for North Carolina, where he was arrested as a fugitive. At the time of his arrest, he was wearing a bulletproof vest and carrying a pistol. Mm -hmm. So... Then he goes back to Fresno and he takes this deal where he pleads no contest to a misdemeanor drug charge and then the felony charges are dropped. It's so crazy. The misdemeanor charge involved the flight of a plane on a drug run from South America to Kentucky in 1979. And Drew, <laughs> Andrew, <laughs> <laughs> and Drew was named as the pilot. So he went to prison for six months and his law license was suspended. Six months. Then he serves his time, repents, comes out of prison, and just becomes this, like, stand-up citizen who right. never even thinks about drugs again. Because right. that's how prison works. Right. Exactly. <laughs> just kidding. So, remember I told you he was one of 25 men uh-huh. accused of those charges in Fresno? Yes. They were all part of this larger crime ring that would later become known as The Company. So crazy. Capital T and the capital C. The Company. And it's not very creative. The Company. The company included several former Lexington police officers and other Kentuckians. So Mm -hmm. thanks for making us look good, guys. (laughs) We're doing big things. (laughs) The company was described in a 1980 federal indictment as a dope and gun running syndicate with more than 300 members and $26 million in boats and planes. So it was a big deal. And like I said, read the Bluegrass Conspiracy 
if you're into this sort of thing because there's so much in there. And I'm just telling you a small part. Yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's just wild. So Andrew's former wife, Betty Zering, said that Andrew was philosophical, incredibly disciplined, extremely spiritual, and a loyal warrior <laughs> with his own code of ethics who thrived on excitement. You think? <laughs> He was described as a daring pilot, a master of martial arts, and like I said earlier, an expert skydiver. Right. Famous among jumpers for something called pulling low, which is releasing the chute at below 2,000 feet. Sounds risky, but whatever. I mean, I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't even attempt it. Wouldn't be anywhere near this. I wouldn't even think about that. I wouldn't even think about that. (laughs) On September 11th, 1985, the body of Andrew Thornton II was discovered in the driveway of Knoxville, Tennessee resident Fred Myers. And I imagine it was a pretty horrific discovery. Andrew had jumped out of a plane, got caught in his parachute, and ended up in a free fall to the ground. He was 40 years old. On his body, they found a key with a number that matched a plane that had crashed earlier that day. And so they deduced the following. Andrew and a guy named David Williams had flown to Columbia to pick up cocaine. Mm -hmm. They dumped packages of cocaine off near Blairsville, Georgia, probably with the intent of returning to to retrieve them later. Right. And then they put the plane on autopilot and jumped somewhere over Knoxville, and the plane went on to crash in Hayesville, North Carolina. Just FYI, David Williams parachuted out and landed successfully in Knoxville. Just remember him because I have a footnote about him at the end. Okay. At the time of his death, Drew was wearing a bulletproof vest, which I just assume he always wears at this point. Uh Uh-huh. It's just a part of his everyday attire. Absolutely. Um, Gucci loafers, which I just, like, (laughs) every article I read made a point to say that he was wearing his Gucci loafers, which I just think is funny. (laughs) I guess maybe that's not normal skydiving attire. Right. Probably not. You would think, like, tennis shoes at least. I mean, probably He had with him some night vision goggles and a green army duffel bag with knives, two pistols, about $15 million worth of cocaine, which is like 77 pounds. Jesus. I mean, 77 pounds in weight, Rachel. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. (laughs) I should have done the kilograms, but I I failed you. Uh, $4,500 in cash and six one ounce mm, Krugerins, Krugerins. Maybe. Mm -hmm. I looked it up. It's a South African coin made of gold. Oh. There were also food rations, vitamins, a compass, an altimeter, which measures altitude. Right. Identification papers and two different names and a membership card to the Miami Jockey Club. Hey, I have my my granddaddy's. I have my granddaddy's Miami Jockey Club card. I'm not sure how much you should be talking about this story. (laughs) (laughs) So I think one of the theories is... You know, I said there's 77 pounds of cocaine, of cocaine, <laughs> of cocaine in that duffel bag. We're really well versed in the things of this world. Mm-hmm. I'm very good at words and drugs. So yeah, mm-hmm. I know all the things. Um, all the things. They think maybe like he wasn't supposed to have that much cocaine in his bag, and it was too heavy, and that might kind of have contributed to what went wrong. Oh, gotcha. And they also thought that Andrew was probably supposed to meet someone on the ground to deliver the cocaine. They got busy. Yeah. Brian Layton, the attorney who had prosecuted Andrew in Fresno, said, quote, I'm glad his parachute didn't open. I hope he got a hell of a high out of that cocaine. Whoa. He was not a fan. He super didn't like Andrew Thornton. And I know what you're all thinking, but Megan, how does the bear fit into this? (laughs) So... Investigators knew Andrew's criminal history, and they surmised that there was probably more cocaine nearby, either dumped from the plane or from the skydivers, and they searched the surrounding area, and they found more than 300 pounds of cocaine. So crazy. Again, I almost said cocaine. Like, what's wrong with me, do you think? <laughs> what is happening? I don't know. It's weird. <laughs> yeah, <I'm> Dead. Doing- <laughs> cocaine is not a thing. Probably. It's not. It, it might be. I don't, hmm. So they also found a 175 pound black bear dead in mm-hmm. the Chattahoochee National Forest, surrounded by 40 open containers with traces of cocaine in them. <laughs> Basically, the bear ate cocaine until it died. It partied hard, which sounds miserable. Uh huh. I mean, just 
I just can't imagine how awful it must have felt (laughs) for this bear. I know. Oh, my God. They estimate that the bear ate about 75 pounds of cocaine. Oh, my God. (laughs) According to the medical examiner, the bear had cerebral hemorrhaging, respiratory failure, hyperthermia, renal failure, heart failure, and stroke. I'm sure that bear was having a really great time until all of a sudden he wasn't. Right. It crashed. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, He was like, oh, no. Oh, what's happening to me? So can you imagine that bear wandering through the woods? Like what's going through its brain? Like if they think like that's we the think, movie. Like if, that's the movie yeah. is that that bear yep. goes off and wanders through the woods. The movie is very loosely based on this story, Yeah, but the movie turns the bear into this like murderous cocaine <laughs> raging <laughs> bear that murders a bunch of people. That didn't happen. This bear didn't kill anybody. There's no evidence that it had any contact with humans at all after it ingested the co- cocaine. Right. And also, it probably would have just been stumbling around trying to Absolutely get to the and yeah. like seeing like five of the same person. He would have just been begging for help. He would not have been trying to attack anybody. Yeah. So the Georgia State Medical Examiner taxidermied the bear, and it was put on display at the Chattahoochee River National Recreation Area in Georgia. (laughs) From there, it was stolen because, of course, it was. Uh, Yes. It later turned up in Waylon Jennings' private collection in Vegas, (laughs) which I think is hilarious. Like, it was stolen, and then Waylon Jennings has it. (laughs) Yes. Yeah, he's like, hey. And then it wound up in a Chinese medicinal shop in Reno. Yes. yes. But since 2015, Cocaine Bear has been right here in Lexington, Kentucky, inside the Kentucky for Kentucky Fun Mall at 720 Bryan Avenue. Yep. And they actually sell a line of Cocaine Bear merchandise there. Yes. Um, I've got the link in the show notes. At Kentucky for Kentucky, he is affectionately known as Pablo Escobar. Yes. It's freaking brilliant. (laughs) I just love those guys. So while I was researching this story and came across the Cocaine Bear merchandise, I just kind of on a whim, I reached out to them and I was like, hey, I see that you have all this merch. I just wondered if you guys would want to give us a discount code to share with our listeners. And they did. They were just so nice about it. And they were like, yes, of course, we'd love to. And so if you want to go check out the Cocaine Bear merch and get something, the discount code is WMMM2020. I love it. So I'll put that in the show notes too. For 20% off. Which is a great discount because a oh lot of times, like, even our sponsors are like, here's 10% off. They're like, no, here's 20%. Here's 20%. And I mean, you'll see if you just go, like I said, I'll put the link in the show notes, but you can go to like kyforky.com. So it's Kentucky mm-hmm. for Kentucky. Yeah. And you'll see it, um, Cocaine Bear, right there at the headings at the top of the page. If you just click there, it takes you to all the merch. And there's like some amazing shirts and hats. And listen... Their quality of their products are so good. Like their shirts are great. You and I both like. Yes, we their shirts are just so soft Mm -hmm. and they fit so well. Yeah, I love them. Yeah, they have a snow globe that they call a blow globe, and I just think that's the funniest thing ever. Oh yeah. (laughs) And like I said, so now there's the movie that's coming out on February twenty third, two thousand twenty three. It's directed by Elizabeth Banks and it stars Carrie Russell and O'Shea Jackson Jr. and the rate the late. Ray Liotta. It was one of his last roles before he died. Yeah. It's a horror comedy, just like this podcast. Yes, exactly. (laughs) About a bloodthirsty bear chasing people through a forest high out of its mind on cocaine. (laughs) So there's a link to the official movie trailer in the show notes, too. (laughs) So much like how you guys noticed that Netflix's The Watcher took a lot of creative liberties with the story of Mm -hmm. the events that happened at 657 Boulevard. It's important to keep in mind that the movie Cocaine Bear was inspired by what happened to the bear who ate cocaine in 1985. It's not a true story. (laughs) So I just, because I kind of feel sorry for the real cocaine bear. Like, how awful. Yeah. I don't know why I want to be defensive of this bear. (laughs) Somebody decides to tell his story and then all of a sudden they just take all the liberties. (laughs) Yeah. They make him a monster. He was just trying to party. I know. Okay, so remember I has I mentioned a footnote. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so the second guy in the plane with Andrew, mm-hmm. the one who bailed out and landed successfully in Knoxville, his name was David Williams. Yes. Three weeks after Andrew Thornton died, David Williams died in a plane crash. 
There's a news article about it from October 7th, 1985. The FBI believes a plane that crashed and killed 17 skydivers was sabotaged by Colombian drug smugglers as revenge for the owner's failure to deliver a $592 million cocaine shipment. So David Williams owned the plane, which was carrying him along with 16 members of a parachutist club. The plane stalled three minutes after takeoff from a private airfield in Georgia and then nosedived onto a rural rural road, killing everyone on board. Investigators from the National Transportation Safety Board found sugar in the fuel system and the FBI got involved. So David and Andrew, on that flight where Andrew jumped out and died, they were supposed to have delivered 880 pounds of cocaine to Colombian smugglers. An unidentified FBI agent said those Colombians are upset that they didn't get their shipment and they wanted to make Williams pay for messing up. So they killed him. Mm. The plan, according to this unidentified FBI agent, was to drop the cocaine in one spot, bail out in another, and send the plane into the ocean. And then when Andrew and David were safe on the ground, they were supposed to contact Andrew's girlfriend, Rebecca, who was waiting there for them. So that was the original plan that all fell apart, I guess, when Andrew's parachute didn't open. Yeah. And then the bear got a hold of it, and the guy was like, listen, I can't deliver because it's in the intestines of this critter. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what a horrible way to die. Yes. So that is the story, the true story mm-hmm. of Kentucky's cocaine bear, which I guess it really, like, he was in Georgia uh-huh. when he was found. That's where the bear died. But I, I think because of the Andrew Thornton connection, they want to, we claim him yes, as ours. Yes, he's <laughs> ours. The story lives here. So spread the word when people start talking about the movie. Yes. That's not the real story. You can send them to this podcast if they want to hear the real right, story. Right. And go get your merch. Yes. I'm going to. I can't I wait. I I've been hanging too. on to this discount code forever, just waiting to share it with you all so that I can use it. <laughs> yes. I know. Same. I'm so excited. When I saw that email pop up, I was like, oh, I can't wait to go buy things. Okay, you guys. Thank you so much for listening. Yeah. We will be back with more episodes soon. Ooh, so excited. All right. We love you so much. Goodbye. Goodbye.